Shalom, everybody. Hope y'all doing fantastic. Let's see if I can tag some people. Baby, hold on. Let's see. All right, so now, as y'all know, uh, my point of view, and I ain't going to try to be too long because my wife's trying to sleep. She's right there. Uh, but I'm going to be in the room tonight. I'm not going to be up. And I'm not, I don't want this to last too long. Uh, probably tomorrow night, I'm going to do a longer session. But uh, y'all know my point of view is what y'all call preterists or all things fulfilled or covenant eschatology, no matter what you want to uh, call it. Uh, I teach and I speak, speak fulfillment. Everything in the Bible has been fulfilled from the perspective that I have, the understanding that I have. Um, I believe it's the correct understanding as well as the original understanding. But recently, people have been um, flooding my posts with different YouTube videos wanting me to look at the videos, right? Um, and not like, I mean, I guess they don't understand that my mentor himself Mr. William Bell has over 500 uh, videos explaining um, our point of view. And now on top of that, I have about 70 something videos explaining uh, my point of view on YouTube. So it's not like that, you know, we're not putting out the information. So people want me to look at these videos and I guess these videos are supposed to explain to me the error of my ways or what not so what I want to do uh, this is the most recent video the brother sent me and uh, it was too much to type so I just want to play you know a little of it and give my commentary of it he want to know where I think that there's difference in and I guess because this person has over 61,000 views and I don't, it's supposed to be a different So I'm just going to go through it. I'm going to play it. And we can see what's going on. All right, this is the YouTube right here. Lion of Yah. The Thousand Year Reign. And then the New Jerusalem. And the True Kingdom. So I'm going to start playing. And I'm going to come in every once in a while. And give my commentary. And provide some biblical scriptures because I think people are this these are supposed to show me the error of my ways so I want to go through it whenever they hear other brothers and sisters talk about the kingdom hello I'm, I'm gonna start over all praise to the most high Yah, the creator of the universe this is your brother M there are many people out there those who are unlearned in certain things about this walk of truth Whenever they hear other brothers and sisters talk about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, many of them have questions. So what I want to do today is I want to speak to some of those brothers and sisters who are new to the walk. And when they see many of us talk about the kingdom this or the kingdom that, I want to help them get understanding about the kingdom. I want to talk about the millennial thousand year reign of the Messiah on this earth. And I want to talk about the age of eternity and the new Jerusalem, which comes after the thousand year reign of the Messiah. Hopefully I can reach some of those who are unlearned or new to the walk, who want to get a true understanding of what is the kingdom. Where is the kingdom? Y'all right, listen up. Y'all listen up. I'm going to go kingdom? get another Bible Where also. All these questions people have and once again, this is supposed to, I guess this is supposed to teach me my error. So let's just listen. This discussion right here may not edify you because you already know these things. This is specifically for the unlearned who don't know about these things, who don't know about the thousand year reign of the Messiah, who don't know about New Jerusalem and the age of eternity where time will no longer be a factor. This discussion may be considered boring to some of you who know these things. I'm going to really take my time in this discussion. This actually may go a couple hours. So 
If you don't have anything else to do, just want to sit down, enjoy this time with Brother L going through these scriptures, I definitely welcome you to do so. Get comfortable, get in a good seat. Hopefully you have time to listen to this in its entirety. If not, you can always stop at certain parts and come back and pick up right where you left off. The fact remains, it's going to get into a lot of details. It's going to get extensive. And I hope that at the end, it will help those of you who want more clarity about the kingdom. You hear us always talking about the kingdom. Hopefully this will give you more clarity, more details, answers to your questions. And ultimately, I hope it puts with you. How you doing, Mr. Bale? Um, devotion to shalom, shalom. I'm a, I'm a to repent. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to contact you tomorrow so and let you know what's all going on with me on my on my behalf. So um, hold on, let me pause this real fast. Messiah, so that you too um, you know, I've just been telling people about our position and how we uh, think, you know, covenant eschatology. And these brothers have been sending me different YouTube videos to check out. And I guess these videos are supposed to show me the error of my ways and my understanding. So a brother just hit me up and said, he sent me this. And he said, well, listen to it and tell me where I differ in this understanding. And he wanted me to write it out on Facebook. But, you know, usually how it goes, it's too much to write out. So instead of doing that, I want to just listen to it live and do a commentary to see uh, if we are alike or where we differ at. And um, to show um, pretty much what the Bible says. Uh, we'll let the Bible be the judge. So that's my goal. That's the point. That's the plan. Uh, Mr. Bell, hopefully that we all enjoy it. But we'll see. And I, I invited the brother who wanted me to do it. I invited him on. Uh, he haven't said nothing yet. But I sent him the invite. So let's see. Once again, this is Lion of Yah. The thousand year reign and then the new Jerusalem, the true kingdom. Uh, Victory Manifest, he has 61,000 views, and I guess he's going to show me the error of my ways, or he's going to show how he agrees with me. So we'll see. Make it to the new Jerusalem. We're going to follow it. And the age of eternity that's also called the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Before we talk about what's going to take place at the end, as I always say, we have to talk about what took place at the beginning. And the beginning meaning what took place when the Most High created this heaven and earth that we live in right now. And when I say earth, the planet that we live on, and when I say heaven, what has been given the phrase the universe in scripture where it talks about heavens what it's actually talking about is the universe the realm of creation that is beyond the firmament for we know in the beginning as it says in genesis chapter one verse well off top uh it's one thing i disagree with i believe that in scriptures heaven and earth is literal heaven literal earth as well as symbolic heaven, symbolic earth. I'm, I don't. And if you go through scriptures, you see that every time it speaks, it's different. First of all, it's different ranks of heaven anyway. If you go through the Hebrew literature, um, I think it was what seven heavens all the way. Anyway, you had, it depends on the Hebrew literature that you um, listen to. But I disagree with every time you see heavens in the scripture. It's talking about the universe. Now, I think it's all well, let me let me let me rephrase that. Because it could be talking about a universal system, but I'm talking about the um dealing with the 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 macros cosmos and all that stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Now, once again, it could be a representation of the cosmos. But it depends on pretty much what you're reading. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute because I'm pretty sure we're gonna we're gonna actually touch it. I'm pretty sure. One through two, let's read it. It says, In the beginning the most high created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of the most high moved upon the face of the waters. 
Here we see that the Most High created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth that we live on and the universe, meaning the creation that is beyond the firmament, the creation that is beyond what we can see with the naked eye or with telescopes, or the creation beyond what is written about in books, be it science books, be it religious books. The Most High has created the heaven and the earth, both the seen realms and the unseen realms have been created by the Most High. And that is this current heaven and earth that we're living in right now. This current realm, this current phase of time, this current era, this current epoch, this current eon that we live in. This is what was created in the beginning by the Most High. And Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through 2 is a chronicle of that history. Now, we know that's what took place in the beginning. So, let's correlate what took place in the beginning to what will take place at the end. For in scripture, there's always patterns. And in scripture and with the Most High, events respawn and history. Shalom, shalom. So just as the Most High created this current heaven and earth, this current earth and universe, there will also be a new heaven and a new earth that he creates. Similar to how if you buy some shoes, those shoes wear out, what do you do? You buy new shoes. Similar to how you get a new car, that car. Now, this is when we start to differ. Um, because the heaven and earth that was created in Genesis from, from my perspective he was correct on but when he started talking about the new heaven and the new earth that was to be created uh, from my perspective it's not talking about the uh, the cosmos no more it's, it's, not, it's no longer it's talking about the universe or the world you gotta see that um, Hebrews themselves had an understanding of how the heavens operated so what the most high did was he gave them something symbolic to have on the earth in order that they represented his whole creation it represented the whole genesis and that my people is was the temple a uh, shalom 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 uh, melanin rich and avia yehuda shalom and let me let me show you this real fast, everybody. Um, this is gonna be kind of extensive, but we see I have a book here, Josephus, and everybody can get Josephus to complete works. And uh, he was a Jew, born under the Roman era. He also was a priest, so he knew a lot about. Um, the way the Hebrew mindset and for us Americans who live in the Western world we have to start studying and getting more back into the Hebrew mindset so this is what the Most High gave mankind because the Most High always gave mankind a replica of the things that he had going on in the other realm when Moses went on Mount Sinai he was able to see the replica of the temple and he put it on earth but let me let's 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 break it down a little bit more um let me find it real fast let's get there that's the lost Let's try to get to this heaven and earth that I believe the Bible is actually speaking of when he said, I will create new heavens and new earths. Okay, here we go right here. Um, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews. You go to chapter 6, right? It says, concerning the tabernacle which Moses built in the wilderness for the honor of God, which seemed to be a temple. All right, so let's see. I don't, I'm not going to get through all of it. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to go through. I want to start at 
uh, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 3, Chapter 6, Section 4. It reads, As for the inside, Moses parted its length into three partitions at the distance of ten cubits from the most secret end. Moses placed four pillars, the workmanship of which was the very same with that of the rest, and they stood upon the like basis with them, each a small matter distant from his fellow. Now the room within those pillars was the most holy place, but the rest of the room was the tabernacle, which was open for the priests. However, this proportion of the measures of the tabernacle proved to be an imitation of the system of the world. For the third part thereof, which was within the four pillars, to which the priests were admitted, as it were, a heaven peculiar to God, but the space of the twenty cubits is as it were sea and land on which men live, and so this part is peculiar to the priest only. So I'm just going to stop it right there. So the tabernacle of the Moses tabernacle. When he went and seen the patterns of how everything was working uh, inside uh, the heavenly, he came back to uh, he came off the mountain and they created the same replica. So the tabernacle that Moses created it had heaven and it had earth. It had heaven, it had sea, it had land. So you have the heaven and earth inside of the tabernacle that Moses created. So then once we fast forward. To the temple. Once we fast forward to the temple. Let's go to the temple now. Give her uh give me a, a moment to find the temple. I think it's closer in book seven. Sorry, I do not have the temple marked, nor the tabernacle. But uh, it's not it's not gonna be too hard to find. Just gotta give me enough time to, to, to get through these chapters. And once again, I'm diving in a little Hebrew uh, history. So I guess it'll be easier if I have my laptop open. I can go straight to it. But sometimes we just got to dig and go page by page in order to get the truth. So now, let me go through. Let me find. Uh, and I hate it, but I might have to actually go online and find it. So that means I'm going to have to uh, go out and come back in, which I didn't want to, but instead of me having to go through all these pages, hold on. I don't know what I uh, uh, color coded it. So give me one second, I'll be right back. Alright, now I'm back, sorry. Uh, War of the Jews, book five, uh, dealing with the, a description of the temple. All right, so now, uh, uh, I'm going to start at uh, book five, chapter five, section four. It is describing some of the things. It was a Babylonian curtain embroidered with blue and fine linen and scarlet and purple and of a contexture that was truly wonderful. Nor was the mixture of colors without its mystical interpretation, but was a kind of image of the universe. For the scarlet there seemed to be enigmatically signified fire by the fine flax, the earth, by the blue, the air, and by the purple, the sea. Two of them have in their colors the foundation of this resemblance, but the fine flax and the purple have their own origin for the foundation. The earth producing the one and the sea the other. The curtain also embroidered upon it all was the mystical was the mystical in the heavens. 
excepting that of the 12 signs representing living creatures. So now, we have the first of all, the tabernacle represented, um, it's, it was symbolic for the heavens and earth. Then you fast forward it to when they got the temple. And inside the temple, it represented the heavens and the earth. So, when the Bible, in fact, now, let's jump off of this. Now, let's go to uh, uh, Revelation. And we see the same thing in Isaiah uh, what, 66. I will create new heavens and earth. But I think Revelation, is it 22? Let me make sure. No, it wasn't. It's not 22. 21. Revelation 21 and 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. So, inside of the temple. What was inside of the temple? It was a representation of heaven. It was a representation of earth. And it was a representation of the sea. Look at verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So what does it says? It's a new heaven and a new earth coming out of New Jerusalem. And look, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse three. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. So we have a new heaven, and that new heaven has the tabernacle of God coming down, correct? So we have a new heaven, we have a new earth, we have a new Jerusalem, we have the tabernacle of God coming down. Well, what did we read about the tabernacle? That's what Moses created. And then later on, they created um, the whole temple, the whole temple layout. The tabernacle was a type of temple. So now, can we see now the correlation between the new heaven, the new earth, and the new temple, which was God? He was the tabernacle. But you read that further on, uh, Christ and, and the Most High was actually the temple and all that stuff. But you read that further on in Revelation. But the point is, the new heavens and the new earth that the Most High was going to create in the Hebrew mind, they would have thought more of the temple before they would have thought of the cosmos. So, we are thinking cosmos here in America in Israel they would have been thinking temple so that's one thing that I disagree with the brother is saying that in the in the future in our future it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth coming and I say no in the past the new heaven and the new earth which was the temple that came after Christ took the throne all of that came and all happened together. It, it's not separated by thousands of years. All of this is one complete thought. It all happens together. So, this is a past fulfilled event. This is not a future event. I'm just telling you from my perspective. So, A, the new heavens and new earth is not literal. It's symbolic for the temple. And the temple was symbolic for the creation that the Most High created in Genesis. He gave mankind a replica of his works. So, technically, when he created new heavens and new earth, uh, it was actually the temple. Because the temple represents the new heaven and the new earth. So, so this is not a literal heaven and earth. This is not him destroying the whole entire planet. So, I showed you out of the Bible... King James Version, and I showed you out of Josephus, uh, um, historian. Um, help me out. I know it's, it's kind of late. So, historian, priest, and Jew. Yeah, there we go. So, now let's keep Breaks going. Down, you get a new car, similar to how you purchase new clothes. You wear those clothes, they wear out. You purchase new clothes. It's no different with the Father in his creation. He has created this earth and universe, this heaven and earth, and he will also create a new heaven and earth and a new earth and universe. The Most High does not change, he only upgrades. 
So what we want to do now is we want to go to Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 1, and we're going to read about the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. All right. And I just <laughs> both talk about the exact same thing. I just touched on it, so we we'll, we we'll see. First, because it will give you a background to understand when I start speaking about the kingdom and the millennial reign of the Messiah and the New Jerusalem. First, we have to understand why all these things will manifest. Here's what it says about the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21. It says, "And I saw a new heaven and a new earth." For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That means this earth and this universe we live in right now will one day be no more. Even secular science tells you. All right. First of all, we're not even going to go into secular science. That's 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 not <laughs> that's nothing we're going to go into because I'm pretty sure they didn't have that understanding during the Bible days. I'm pretty sure there's some type of New philosophy, new philosophy for mankind. I'm pretty sure they wasn't talking about it in the Bible days. Well, compared to these elements melting and the sun not giving off the the appropriate heat that it gave off last year, that all of this is going to come to an end. I'm pretty sure that's not what they was doing. So we're not going to use uh, secular science to understand the Bible, but we can. We're going to concentrate, and I'm going to go to uh, Revelation 21 so we all can see it. All right, so let me start it. What about this? That this current universe and earth will one day be destroyed. The scriptures say the exact same thing. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. All right, can there I, was no more sea. Can I ask y'all a question, though? Y'all don't think it would have freaked John out to see the entire world population be destroyed? Like the entire, the, every the entire everything be destroyed, and if if it's literally saying that the new heavens, well the earth and heaven was going to be destroyed, then why in Revelation twenty two and what's that? Revelation twenty two and fourteen fifteen. Why do we have dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers outside of the kingdom? See, this is this is our problem when we look at this vision and take it literal. So now we're going to say that the Most High is literally going to destroy the whole entire planet. Wicked and good. The whole planet. Then he's going to save some wicked and good people and put them on a new planet. Why wouldn't he just get rid of all of the wickedness? Why would he bring wickedness right back to the new planet? That wouldn't make sense, would it? I mean, that whole philosophy, and I used to be in that philosophy too, and now I realize how it doesn't make sense at all, not knowing our father. But, I mean, we're going to work with it. We're going to work through it. But Revelation 22, just in case you need to know, Revelation 22 and 15, uh, 14 and 15 talks about the city. Right, the, the city will be in New Jerusalem, correct? So, if the city is in New Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem is supposed to be on the new earth, why are there dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers on the outside of the gate? Why didn't the Most High kill these people? Why did the Most High save these wicked people and put them in the new city? Or well, put them outside of the new city. He allowed these wicked people to go right back into earth. So, in other words, he just did the same thing that he did. He could have done without destroying the world. If that's what we're trying to get at. But, no, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work if we're gonna take this literal. Because it's so much that <laughs> it's just so much that, 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 it, that won't fit. We can't force it in there. So let's let's leave America. Let's go back to Israel. Let's let's go back to the Eastern mindset, and let's let's keep going. Let's let's keep going. Let's keep going right here. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from the Most High out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, "Behold, the tabernacle of the Most High is with men." 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, real fast. Uh, I got a brother that's saying I think he's want to defend this, uh, this understanding that's that's going on on YouTube. He said the wrong do doers left will be cleansed by the devil, being unleashed on the earth. No, my brother, these wrongdoings and these wrongdoers in Revelation 22 is occurring after the new heavens and the new earth come. So, these wrongdoers in Revelation 22 escaped the world being destroyed. How they did that, if we're going to take this literal, nobody knows. The Bible never claims how evil people were going to escape the world exploding. I still don't know that. Uh, now, I know the good people were supposed to be so-called took up to heaven, correct? But how did the evil people survive also? And then when the good people came back, then the evil people came right back with them, but they had to stand outside of the gate. So what's supposed to go on with these evil people just walking outside of the gate in the new heavens and the new earth? Once again, these evil people are in the new heavens and the new earth. They're just on the outside of the gate. So how did they get there? What's supposed to go on with them? And this proves that evil is never supposed to stop. Evil was never ever supposed to stop in the first place. That's not the point of the Bible. The point of the Bible was to get the righteous people to the Most High. Not the unrighteous. The unrighteous will stay unrighteous. The righteous people were supposed to be back in unison. Supposed to be back tabernacling with the Most High. Not the unrighteous. They stay outside of the gate. They don't never enter inside of the gate. But if we're going to take this vision literal, then we have problems. Because now, we, I need an answer to how these wicked people survive the destruction of the first heaven and the first earth. And the Most High allowed them to come to the new heaven and the new earth just to do the same wickedness they was doing in the first heaven. But doesn't the scripture say there will be no evil left, no death, no crime? The scripture does not, it does say that, but there you go right there. There you go. There you go. And my, uh, my mentor, Mr. William Bell, you just can read what he just said. That, that's it right there. And the no crying, the no death, the no evil, it all was going on according to the covenant of Moses. The Torah was bringing all of this stuff to the forefront. That's why the, that covenant system had to pass and the new covenant system had to come. So this is your evil and the death and the crying. It's, it's coming because of the wrath of the Father to Israel of them breaking his laws. So that's what that's coming from. That's why we needed a new covenant. That's why we needed Christ. Christ's sacrifice took away the evil, the death, and the crying. But I'm going to just read what Mr. Uh, William Bell said. He said, The devil is destroyed before the new heavens and earth arrives. He only had a short time, which was Revelation 12, 12, Revelation 21 through 7, and 12 through 14. The millennium, thousand years, ends before the new heaven and earth arrives, which is absolutely correct. So, let's keep going. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and the Most High himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. And the Most High shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any pain, for the former things are passed away. These particular verses of Scripture totally shut down many of the doctrines that's out there of people saying that we're already in the kingdom of heaven now. <laughs> so this is what this supposed to do. It shuts down. It shuts these verses shuts down us being in the kingdom of heaven right now. Okay. <laughs> so now, let, let's go to it again. 
Uh, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So now, what are the what what was part of the former things? Which covenant was part of the former things? First of all, which covenant brought sorrow, crying, death, and pain? Huh? In fact, can we find it? Can we? Hold on. Let me let me let me find it real fast. Let me let me find it so we can so we can see what what's being said here. Is it in uh, is it in Galatians? Uh, no, it's not in Galatians. Let's see here. Where's it at, Mister Bell? Where's it? Uh, what what uh, what verse did he call um the 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 stones the ministration of death? Is it Corinthians? Oh, the Romans. Help me out, Mr. Bell. I don't want to have to back back out of this and, and come back in it. So I know you know it off your head. Uh, what verse was that when he called the uh, the the stones the the administration of death? Second Corinthians three and six. All right, that's my mentor right there. So he, he's on it. So here we go right here. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6 who also made us able ministers of the New Testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And we could keep uh, we can keep reading on into that. Thank you, Mr. Bell. And we can keep reading on into that. But as you can see right now, this no more death. This this no more all tears should be wiped away. No more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. These are the things that was occurring uh, because Israel was under that that covenant. It was under the Mosaic covenant. So every time they broke the covenant, there was a curses that came. So that death. That pain, that crying, that groaning, that sorrow, it all occurred because they were under the Mosaic Covenant. When the Mosaic Covenant left and the New Covenant came, guess what? The tears left, the death left, the sorrow left, the crying left, the pain left, all, all of those former things left. In the covenantal realm, this is not talking about somebody stubbing their toe and their toe hurting or somebody's passing away uh, physically on this earth. This is not that type of death that they was talking about. They was talking about separation from the father. All of this stuff is separation from the father. All of this is the father's wrath upon his people and them being separated from him. This is what, this is what all of this is about. Under Christ, all of this stuff left. So this does not disprove that we are in the new, that we today are in the new uh, kingdom. It does the opposite. Because if you feel that you have a relationship with the Father, then by default, you have to be in the new kingdom. Because you could not have a relationship with the Father while you were still in sin. And ain't nobody went and sacrificed no lambs in thousands of years to even get on the radar of the Father. So, if you feel that you have a relationship with the Father, by default, you understand that the kingdom of heaven is upon earth. Christ is ruling and reigning. If you believe on Christ, he's ruling and reigning right now on earth. 
You can't get away with it. But let's keep going. Well, we know that's not true for the scripture here says that in this new heaven and new earth, there's no more death, no more crying. Look around at this current life in this world. Is there still death? Is there still crying? Absolutely there is. That means we are not in the kingdom of heaven yet. So, this is the type, and I'm not knocking the brother because he probably don't have the correct understanding yet. And I'm not saying that I'm all knowing because I have a lot of growing to do, but that's what studying does. You got to study. You got to be other people that study also. You got to listen to the Bible over man-based philosophy. The problem is we listen to a lot of people who have not studied the scriptures. A lot of people look at these words and take it from a Western mindset and they try to explain and interpret the Bible from a Western mindset. Therefore, everybody is parakeeting Western thought, which is foreign to the Bible. The Bible wasn't worried about no American doctrine. So you got to go back to the original thought. So, these were more spiritual people. These people saw the earth, I mean, they saw the, 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 the sky crack open. They heard the, the, uh, the, the wonders of the Most High's voice. They saw angels. They saw um, uh, the sea open up. They saw people being brought back from death. They saw a lot of miraculous things. A lot of miraculous things. So think about their mindset. And then think about the American mindset who sees a lot of negative stuff. And then they try to uh, make it fit in the Bible. Well, this is happening because uh, the Bible says in the last days. No, 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 no. Let's, let's go back to the original mindset of the Bible. So, and if Christ, uh, if Christ said, uh, in fact, I just want to hit this real fast and then I'm going to go on it. I'm going to go on it right here. Let's go to the favorite verse that everybody knows. John 3, 16. Everybody knows it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, that right there, is that not proof enough to show you that, no, death is not still occurring. How can, how can Christ say such a powerful word right there and we know he was talking to the israelites right here but it's way more way deeper this message is way deeper than just for the israelites so now for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so did christ lie right there christ said that whoever believe on the son will not die but have everlasting life so did Christ lie? Did Christ lie right here? So how are we talking about we can't be in the kingdom because people are dying when Christ said it all the way back here that whoever believed in him will have everlasting life, will not perish. So, I mean, are we picking and choosing what part of the Bible we want to believe it, to go with a doctrine? So, I mean, but let's continue. Let's continue. Those who were trying to teach to you that doctrine that we are. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Mr. Martin. Uh, I've been getting a lot of people been sending a lot of uh, YouTube videos to my page, I guess, to show me the error of my ways when I say all things have been fulfilled. So this is one of the. Sorry. Hold on. Let me let me let me cut this. All right, I thought I was on my Wi-Fi, but I wasn't. So now I'm on my Wi-Fi. So hopefully it won't cut off again. But uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Martin, a lot of people have been sending videos to my page trying to show me the error of my ways. And I was asked to do a commentary on this video, what I agree with or what I disagree with. And within the first eight minutes, it's so much that I had to show what I disagree with. So, you know, maybe as we go further on, I agree with some stuff. But right now... Uh, it's rocky. In the kingdom of heaven now, they are sadly mistaken. For we still deal with death. We still deal with sorrow. We still deal with pain. And we still deal with crying tears out of our eyes. 
We are not in the new heaven and new earth right now. Let's keep reading about the new heaven and the new earth. It says, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from the most high, having the glory of the most high. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The prophet here is seeing the headquarters of the new heaven and the new earth. The new Jerusalem is not the totality of the new heaven and the new earth, but it is the headquarters where the Most High himself will live and reign and dominate the universe and the worlds from the headquarter of New Jerusalem. Hallelujah. And it's going to give us details about this city, even more proof that we are not in the kingdom of heaven right now. I, I just think he made it up. No city that fits the description I just, of what's written right I here. think he making now, the I mean our person the most high I think he's just giving more of what he thinks right now instead of the Bible that's all I'm saying I'm thinking I'm thinking, I'm thinking he's making it up right now as they dub it and as they call it that they're trying to build in Saudi Arabia but the adversary will never be able to equal the glory of the new Jerusalem listen to the description of this city it says and the city had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. That right there completely refutes the doctrine of those who say it doesn't matter who the children of Israel are, for we see here in the scripture that the names of the 12 tribes of Israel will be written on the gates of heaven. Every time you walk in and out of the gates, you have to look to see the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. So those who are teaching, specifically a lot of these Gentiles and the Christians, who teach that it doesn't matter who the children of Israel are. Uh, yo. First of all, I don't know nobody who really teaches that it doesn't matter who the children of Israel are. Which, technically, per se, I don't think it matters who the children of Israel are today. Because the point is, Christ is Israel. And the Most High chose Israel for his own reasons in order to be um, the forerunners of uh, the new covenant. So, because everything was established from the beginning. The new covenant, uh, pieces of it was, was spoken of even in to, to Adam, actually. So, this concentrating on Israel more than concentrating on the on, on Christ and the Father, it has to stop because I'm pretty sure when you're in when you're in uh, the heavenly heavens, you're not gonna be running around looking at gates, uh, talking about I'm proud to be an Israelite to be in this gate. I'm pretty sure we're missing the whole point behind the Bible. We're concentrating too much on Israel and not enough on Christ. I mean, you know when you Israel, right? All right, some people lied about the history. That's true. You know, it's a possibility that a lot of uh, Negroes are Israelites. That's true. But what is it? What does that put you in the kingdom of heaven? How has that helped you in your day-to-day -day walk? Has the Most High did anything differently since you found out that you were an Israelite? So if thing if life is happening just the way it was happening before you find out you was an Israelite, how do you feel or why do people feel that that's gonna change? I mean, what's the glory of the Father you being an Israelite? How does that glorify the Father? Let's get off of self and let's worry more about Christ. Okay, we supposed to be worshiping the Father. We're supposed to be honoring the king. Y'all want some whole other stuff. Y'all done took the king from... Y'all done took the kingdom out of Christ and made it all about y'all selves. I don't think that's going to work. But let's keep going. Are we're all one? Well, the father looks at that differently because the names of the 12 tribes are going to be written on the eternal gates of heaven. Listen to what it says. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. 
on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb and he that talked with me and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lie of four square hold on now so this is also my beef this is my beef also how do we concentrate so much on the gates having the 12 tribes of Israel? Okay. But then once we get to verse, let me get to it again. 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. How do we overlook that the foundation of the walls in the city were built upon the 12 disciples like why do we skip that y'all know foundations hold up things foundations keep things um um what's the word i'm looking for a foundation keeps things i guess molded it keeps things it keeps things structured uh it makes it makes things um um ah i don't know too many arch architecture of, of, of lingos but y'all know what a foundation does it it keeps things uh um correct i know that's not the right word but y'all get what i'm saying it, it makes things uh, uh y'all gotta give me something give me something y'all what does a foundation do give me something it's it's a um level it keeps things leveled i like that it keeps things built it makes thing it makes it hard to fall it makes it hard to crumble if you if you put a house on a good foundation unless something uh uh natural happened nine times out of ten it stays there for a long time compared to a rocky foundation so if the if the city if the if the city inside of the kingdom of heaven is built upon the twelve apostles, shouldn't we adhere to what the twelve apostles taught? Now, did we see the twelve apostles going around talking about I'm a children I'm a child of Israel. Israel, 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 Israel. No, 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 you, you did not. You see the 12 apostles first speaking out of the Tanakh. And then you see them give the explanation or the fulfillment of the Tanakh. And you see them bringing in the Gentiles. You see them baptizing. You see them talking about the kingdom of heaven. You see them glorifying Christ. You see them glorifying the Father. You see all of this out of the 12 apostles who, who happens to be the foundation of the city. And you see, let's talk about Israelites. So, not saying Israel wasn't important because the 12 disciples was Israelites. But if you're not speaking what they're speaking, then you're not talking about, you're not teaching the foundation of the kingdom. Your whole foundation is off. Your whole thing is rocky. It's built on ground. It's built on uh, uh, something that can be destroyed easily. That's why you got to have a good solid foundation. And what's a good solid foundation according to Revelation 21? And 14, the apostles was a great foundation. So let's go back to the apostles and see what they was teaching before we get into this um, I'm an Israelite thing. That's all I'm saying. And let's not just skip over. Let's not concentrate and, and emphasize the 12 on this wall it was three gates of Israelites and on that was three gates of Israelites but yeah but then it's on the foundation of the 12 disciples but then we got more now we're not going to do it like that come on y'all and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs the length and breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall there, thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. 
How many cities do you see on this earth that are made of pure gold? You don't see none like that. That means we're not in the kingdom of heaven yet. How many cities? Okay, so now. Now let's 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 step back. Let's let's step back. Okay, let's let's step back. Alright, um Give me one sec. Let's step back. Alright. So now we're gonna concentrate on, on the gold and stuff. Alright. Alright, y'all, I'm trying to find something real fast because I think I went over this. Uh... Alright. Let's see here. Ah, right, y'all. I'm 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 still here. I'm still here. I'm just trying to find these because now we're concentrating on um, what the kingdom looks like, and I I just want to put this more in perspective. Uh, here we go right here um let's go to the antiquities of the jews chapter 14 um sorry book 7 chapter 14 section 9 it says when david had ordered all of the offices after the manner before mentioned he called the rulers of the hebrews and their and their heads of tribes and the officers over the several divisions and those that were appointed over every work and every possession and standing upon a high pulpit he said to the multitude as follows my brethren and my people i would have you know that i intended to build a house for god and prepared a large quantity of gold and a hundred thousand talents of silver. But God prohibited me by the prophet Nathan because of the wars I had on your account and because my right hand was polluted with the slaughter of our enemies. But he commanded the sun, right? So, uh, this is what he had right here. Let's go to one... 377. He also declared to them that their work would be easy and not very laborious of them because he had prepared for it many talents of gold and more of silver with timber and many great carpenters and stone colors, cutters and a large quantity of emeralds and all sorts of precious stones. And right here for all the people talking about the chariots right here. Well, I'm going to keep reading. And he said that even now he would give of the proper goods of his own dominion 200 talents and 300 other talents of pure gold for the most holy place and for the chariot of, chariot of God, the cherubim, which are to stand above uh, or over the ark. So now we see that when they talk about the chariots of God, they're actually the cherubims right there. So that's just a, a good side note. But in Revelation... It describes this place made of glass 
and all of these stones and all of this gold. Guess what that is? The same thing that the temple had on earth in Jerusalem. So hopefully now you're understanding what you're actually seeing in Revelation. See, I like being able to show y'all this. And you can go read it yourself. So, in Revelation, you're reading one thing, and then we can actually find it in history also, the same exact thing. So, he's seeing a vision, it seems, of the temple. And people are like, where do you see this head on planet Earth? <laughs> well, my brother... It seems like that they've been more. Uh, this is it's all about uh, temple talk, temple language, all about worshiping the Father more than him worrying about you getting a physical landmass made of gold. I don't know. Do you see they got twelve gates with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel written on it? You don't see no cities like that, so you know we're not in the kingdom of heaven yet. So all these false prophets you hear talking about follow me to this place. I'm the most high. I'm the Messiah. Come here. Come there. What was the warning of the Messiah to you? He said, whenever they say, lo, the Messiah is here or lo, he is there or here he is in the wilderness or here he is in a secret place. Don't believe them. Okay, so now. We are not in the kingdom of heaven yet. Okay, so now. If he want to take that note. If he, if he wants to, if he want to go there, we go the man. <laughs> See, my brother, uh, where you at? Uh, I think he left. Uh, uh, brother uh, Tavaya Jacob, you sent me this video and you wanted me to break it down why I disagreed with it. And uh, it seems after I said a few things, Mr. Bell said a few things, you left maybe because it's late and maybe you'll come review this video. But with the brother just named, he said, um, when they say low here, low there, let's see what, what, what that said. Let's, let's see what that said. Um, it's the false prophets. Uh, is that in uh, Matthew 24? Let's see. I don't know. And that should be offend them, betray one another. False prophets shall arise. What's awesome? Here you go, right here, Matthew 24 and 23. Says, Matthew 24 and 23. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it was possible they shall deceive the very elect. But where do we leave off at? Alright, if we throw this in and say, well uh, it's going to be many false prophets and we're not in the kingdom of heaven and, and the false prophets are going to say low here and low there. Well my brother, this that you pull from is talking about Signs for the destruction of the temple. See? Verse 24, I mean Matthew 24, 2 and 3. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world. We know there's supposed to be age right there. So, you, the brother just gave a, um, a, uh, a prophecy or a sign and he linked it with the new kingdom of heaven and earth and it's almost correct because it's really linked with the destruction of the temple if you keep the Bible in context and the destruction of the temple occurs before the new heaven and the new earth so it's all in there together it's, so I mean, your foundation is you're you're kind of right, but you don't know how you're right. <laughs> if that makes sense. So you're 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 almost there, but you're not thinking nothing about the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D. See, we're thinking about the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D. So we can move into the future to deal with 
uh, the new heavens and the new earth having to come uh, by because of the temple being destroyed. So we understand that this is Christ coming and the Father coming to the tabernacle with mankind because he just cut off that Mosaic uh, covenant. And now everybody has no choice but getting the new covenant if they want to uh, have a relationship with the Father. See, we understand this. It all goes, goes together. But y'all leave out the whole entire 70 AD and Christ coming back and y'all still waiting on him and coming in the future. Y'all throw away so much information trying to uh, uh, think and trying to hold for some future event that's really a past event. And if you could see it's a past event, then we wouldn't make two hours and 23 minute videos trying to say that the Bible doesn't say what the Bible says. We won't say that we won't make a two hour and 20 minute video telling people that they're not inside of the kingdom. If we believe the Bible, we will make a two hour and 20 minute video proving to people that they are actually inside of the kingdom. But let's keep going. There's no man on this planet that can build a city that is like the city of the New Jerusalem I'm reading about. Let's keep reading. And the foundations of the wall. Moses the city, did it. Uh, Solomon the did it. Zerubbabel did it. Well, not all the way. The King Herod did it. The so. An emerald, the fifth Sardonyx. The sixth Sardius. The seventh Chrysolite. The eighth Beryl. The ninth a Topaz. The tenth a Chrysoprasus. The eleventh a Jason. The twelve an Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Remember, this is talking about the new Jerusalem. All right? Listen to what it says. This is talking about the new heaven and new earth. It says, and I saw no temple therein, for the Most High Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. In the new Jerusalem. Okay, so now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, let's get this right. Alright, so now, and I'm thinking that those stones that were said was actually the stones of Israel. And I was trying to find it, but I can find that later. I think that those are the 12, uh, those stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But, um, my brother, <laughs> he said that, verse which is, uh, sorry, uh, Revelation 21 and 22. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So, inside of this city. See, he just named the city, right? He just named, he, he named the walls. He named the foundations of the wall. So once you go inside of the wall and the foundation of the wall, and now, now notice the foundation of the wall and the walls actually had the same characteristics of the old temple. So inside of this new city that has the same characteristics of the temple, what did he see? He saw the father and the son being the temple. He saw the Father and the Son being the temple. So let's keep going. Jerusalem, in the eternal heavenly realms, there will be no temple. There will be no temple in the New Jerusalem with Levites doing animal sacrifices. I agree there with that. There will be no temple where blood sacrifices are taking place. There will be the, no the guy name is Lion of Yah. There will be no Muslim mosques. There will be no Jewish synagogues in New Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the millennial reign of the Messiah. I agree there with that. There will be a temple in the millennial reign of the Messiah, but in New Jerusalem there will be no temple. We have to go through this so we can differentiate because sometimes people get the millennial reign of the Messiah mixed up with New Jerusalem. There's not going to be no temple in New Jerusalem. There's not going to be no churches in New Jerusalem. For the Most High and the Messiah will be the temple. Hallelujah. But 
there will be a temple in the thousand year reign of the Messiah. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Just let me lay some more groundwork about this. Remember, we're talking about the new heaven and the new earth in these scriptures. The prophet said, and I saw no temple therein. For the Most High Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of the Most High did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. That's the second thing we learn about the new heaven and the new earth. There will be no sun, and there will be no moon. In the new heaven and new earth, there's no sun, no moon, no temple. So we're beginning to see the details that differentiate the thousand year reign of the Messiah from the new Jerusalem. We have to make these differentiations. All right. Listen to what it says next. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Okay, so now. So now, what is John the Revelator talking about? What's all going on with John the Revelator? Because he's saying a whole lot of stuff and he's laying down a whole lot of stuff. And I'm just here to tell you that the only thing he's doing, he's pulling from the Tanakh. And he's explaining the new covenant system. He's pulling from the Tanakh and he's explaining all of the new covenant system and how the new covenant is going to be laid out. That's all he's doing. He's explaining um, what to expect out of the new covenant. He's just using more of a what? I don't want to say well they let me get it right. They translated it in more of a Roman mindset than in uh, Hebrew mindset. So let's go back to the Hebrew mindset so we can get a little bit more of the information, right? And we'll see what John is actually pulling from. All right, let's go. Isaiah 60, and I want to start at 14. With 13. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together. To beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. So remember, um, uh, he said, you know, the Most High was the temple, and he was trying to make a distinction between when the temple was and when the temple was not. So let's talk about uh, what what John the Revelation is actually pulling from. Verse 14, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all that, that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall come, uh, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. So, who is the city of the Lord? Who is the Holy Zion of the Holy One of Israel? Once again, who is the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel? So, he's seeing the city here, right? And the city is resembling uh, all of the things, all of the elements of um, the first temple. So now, he's pulling from a passage dealing with Israel, correct? But not only Israel, up here this is dealing with the Gentiles. Once you go into the abundance of the sea, which are the Gentiles, and you go further down, you have Israel. So you have the Gentiles and Israel in the same segment in Isaiah 60, getting some of this new covenant. But let's keep reading, though. Whereas thou have been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency. A joy of many generations. Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shalt suck the breast of kings. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that I the Lord am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood brass, and for stones iron. I will make thy officers peace, and thou 
exact towards righteousness. So right here, when I'm seeing this gold, iron, silver, wood, brass, stones, I'm thinking about the temple. This is temple talk. This is what I'm thinking about. But verse 18, violence shall be no more heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call the, thy walls salvation, and thou gates praises. So now, this is more talking about the people. See, look, they shall call the people of the Lord, uh, the city of the Lord, and the Zion of the heart, and the peoples who's called the city and the Zion, they will have, um, uh, let me see here, they will have walls of salvation and gates of praise. Uh, verse 19, the sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy God, thy, and thy God, thy glory. Thy sun shall be shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the works of my hand, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. So now... And this is all about the spreading of the gospel and all that stuff. So, we actually see in Revelation that he's actually just pulling from Isaiah. And Isaiah was talking about mainly the Jews, well, the Israel and the Gentiles coming together and uh, under the new covenant and um, being that righteous branch, that, well, sorry, that righteous city that the Most High needs them to be. Now, this is the understanding that I get from it. Mr. Bell, if I'm incorrect, go ahead and correct me. Go ahead and uh, put, on some, uh, put on some commentary for me. But that's what I get from it. And uh, Mr. Bell is my mentor, so uh, I take all his word as gold. <laughs> he's, been doing it for, for, he, he's been doing it for a while. He understands it. So, if, if I said anything incorrect, go ahead and bring it down. Or if you want to add more to it, go ahead and write so I can tell the people. But, that's where he's pulling from. This is dealing more with the Jews, well, the Israel and the Gentiles coming under the new covenant. This is not nothing that I believe that he that should be taken as a literal uh, manner right now. I think this is just talking about the most high coming to fellowship with mankind again under Christ. This is what I get from Revelation. But once again, I wait on my mentor to uh, bring it out a little bit more. But let's keep going. That's another thing we're learning about the new heaven and the new earth. Since there will be no sun or no moon, there will also be no night in the new heaven and the new earth. That's how you know we are not in the kingdom of heaven yet. Because right now, in this realm that we live in, there's the sun, there's the moon, there's religious temples, and there's nighttime. We are not in the kingdom of heaven yet. We are not in the days of the new Jerusalem yet. Listen. Okay, so now do y'all see what happens when you take a vision so literal? Once we start taking visions literal, then... We, we come up with different doctrine that's unheard of by the Israelites of the of the of the antiquity. See, the the Israelites back then would have understood that he was pulling from uh, Isaiah's prophecy. They wouldn't think that John was saying his own prophecy and a whole lot of this um, stuff was literal. Do y'all not understand that in second um was it Second Thessalonians when they thought that the resurrection and the judgment all this is all of that has already occurred. Don't y'all understand that this occurs um, doing around that same time? So if they thought that all of that has already occurred, why come they weren't saying, where's the new kingdom of heaven? At? Why come the earth didn't get destroyed? If, if they thought the resurrection had already occurred, then that means that their understanding of the resurrection might be a little different than our understanding of the resurrection. How else could they have been talking about the resurrection already occurred so hold on give me one second give me one second give me 
Now one second everybody. It's kind of late. I know it's late, but give it one sec. So now, let's see. Yeah. And I'm not as king as uh, on all of these verses as other people. Well, let, let's see here. Um, 2 Thessalonians 1 and sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2 and let's start at 1 now we beseech you brother by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of Christ is at hand or has come it depends on the version you look at. Let's see if I can. Let's see what it says in this version. I'm not sure. Uh, the Discipleship Study Bible. I just want to see what it says in this one. They might have got it the same exact way. And I left my New King James Version Bible in the other room. So. As the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and now we gather together, brothers. Let's see what it says. All right, here we go, right here. Not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. So now, in the second Thessalonians, <clears throat> I believe they was getting letters. Uh, people was, was actually creating letters and saying that it was coming from the apostles saying that Christ had already came back and the resurrection had already occurred. Now, this was about 2,000 years ago, y'all. So, this ain't about us today. This is uh, uh, something that was going on 2,000 years ago. And Paul was letting it be known. No, no, no. Look, y'all. The temple is still standing. Okay? Christ can't come back until the temple is destroyed. That was the whole main point of Christ's um, prophecy. The temple was going to be destroyed. The the the, uh, the the man of sin was going to come. He was going to sit in the temple as God and proclaim to be God. Then the temple had to be destroyed. That's when the resurrection was going to occur. And during the resurrection, then we have the great white throne judgment, which they wouldn't have called it the great white throne judgment. That's what we call it here in America. But you have the great white throne judgment, which was the end of the Mosaic covenant when they started, um, when everybody was supposed to be judged off of the covenants that they was in. Um, outside of the new covenant and then uh, we had the new heavens and a new earth and then we had um, the father coming down the tabernacle with mankind under the gospel so all of this is this now so this is a good point I mean doesn't the kingdom of heaven have to be established with Christ the man and a literal earthly king he came as a babe he came was the lamb and the Jews still await the earthly king. I can relate to how we missed him. Oh, yeah. Well, we're saying 100 percent. Well, Christ and already um, the Bible is completed it, itself. This is literally a history book. It tells you how to how we got to the new covenant and how the kingdom of heaven actually came upon earth and how the father and son is with us on earth right now. And we're all ruling and reigning under the gospel. And the, um, my favorite verse to go <clears throat> to prove all of that is 
uh, Loot 20, Loot 21. And let me just show you real fast. This is my favorite verse to pull off that prove all, everything I just said. Uh, Luke 21 and 20, what, 22. I start at 21 and 21. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So, this days of vengeance was actually talking about the destruction of the temple. That's why, um, uh, you see right here, verse 6, and as it came, behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, Master, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And, you know, blah, blah, this and that. So, <clears throat> all of this dealt with the destruction of the temple. So, Christ said during the destruction of the temple, everything written in the Tanakh was to be fulfilled at that time. So, all things, the scripture also said that his presence will be absent, that his presence will be absent for a while. Uh, I don't, uh, could you tell me the verse that you're actually talking about? But, once you go, go in your Bible, go to Luke 21 and 22, it says it right there. For these be the things of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So, if Christ said all things which are written may be fulfilled, by that time, that means all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then my second favorite verse to go to is Matthew 16, 27 and 28. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He was talking to the disciples. <clears throat> and the Most High promised his disciples that some of them would still be alive when he came in his kingdom, which is... The so-called, what we call in America, the second coming. What they call in what, uh, Greek, the parousia. Uh, I don't know what they call it in Hebrew. But it's all about him coming in judgment to render judgment upon Israel and upon mankind, which he did. All past events. So Revelation itself is about 70 A.D. It's a vision behind 70 A.D., what was going on in the spiritual realm as well as the physical realm. But let's keep going. And uh, sister, uh, provide that verse for me that you're talking about. What it says next, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and they shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those give you the details about the new Jerusalem and the age of eternity. Now, okay, so now let's go back again to Genesis chapter one. Hold on, hold on. So now he's talking about um, the people written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right? Uh, -uh parousia means presence. Uh, there, there is no rapture inside the Bible. Uh, parousia means uh, a presence. And the presence of Christ was the Roman army. Just he did just the same thing his father did. Uh, when uh, once you go through, I think it's, is it Ezekiel dealing with um, who was that? Uh, who was the king Nebuchadnezzar? Whatever the king of Babylon was, but he kept saying. If this happened, then you will know I'm the Lord. 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 So, um, the way that the Most High presented himself to mankind was to show his wrath was through like other nations, uh, through other armies destroying Israel. That's pretty much what it was. It's pretty much the Most High using other nations to destroy Israel. So, Christ did the same thing his father did. How do you know that Christ's presence was there, or his parousia, or however you want to define it? The Roman army 
The Roman army was Christ's way of proving that he was the Messiah. The Roman army came and destroyed uh, everything in 70 AD, but 70 AD was so important because not only did the Roman army come do away with the temple, it did away with everything in the Mosaic Covenant to prove what tribe that you were from. Um, it took out a new, it took out the old system, so now you had to worship mo uh, the Most High in a new way under Christ. It took out the Torah and brought forth the gospel. Uh, everybody on, in the spiritual realm, everybody was judged on the covenant that they was in. Uh, the Most High was able to come tabernacle with mankind. We was able to enter into the new covenant. So much things, so many things happened at 70 A.D. besides the destruction of the temple. And actually, once you read throughout the scripture, every war that they're talking about was the war of 70 A.D. The one third, two thirds that people keep miss, uh, keep abusing, talking about at the end. Uh, not everybody's going to make it. Uh, only one third is going to make it. Two thirds going to be cut off. That happened during the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The one third that didn't get cut off was the one third that listened to Christ and fled into the mountains. The two thirds that got cut off are the people that stood around and did the feast of the Mosaic Covenant and the Most High allowed them to be destroyed. So, then we got the 144,000. Who are the 144,000? Well, the 144,000 will be the new kings and priests that listened to the Most High and fled into the mountains. They will be the ones who survived and was able to bring in the new covenant. So, it's all the same. Oh, uh, it's all good. It's all good, since it's whenever you can find it. So, but um, the brother was talking about the Lamb, the Lamb's Book of Life. Let me see if I can find that real fast in Daniel. Let me, let me see if I can find it real fast in Daniel. This this rabbit hole goes deep. If we come out of the American mindset, we'll be we'll be straight. All right now. Daniel 12 and 1. <clears throat> and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. And in um, the Septuagint, it calls it uh, a, a time of tribulation. A time of trouble such as never, never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that is found written in the book. So we have that, that book of life right there. That we have that same book spoken of in Revelation. We have these people being delivered that's found written in that book. And how was they delivered? How was these people found written in that book delivered? They listened to Christ and fled into the mountains. This, this, this fleeing... This fleeing happened in 70 AD when Christ told them to flee into the mountains. This, this is why Christ, you listen to Christ. Moses said there's going to be a prophet. If you don't listen to that prophet, you will be cut off. Christ was that prophet. You didn't, they didn't listen to his prophecy. They was cut off. That's what Christ, what Christ tell them in Matthew 24 and... See, 21, this is the same uh, tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as it was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor should there ever will be. Um, what is it at? Uh, ah, listen. Uh, no, 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 this should be here. Uh, verse 15 and 16. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So you got to go right back to Daniel to understand. Stand in the holy place, whosoever read it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. It, it indeed was a, a, a war. In fact, once you go to uh, Luke 21, once you go to Luke 21, you have it right here. Uh, Luke 21 uh, and 20 it says and when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies then know that the desolation thereof is not so that was the Roman army 
the this is talking about the Roman army in 70 AD. It has nothing to do with today's time. Nothing at all to do with today's time. Nothing at all. And once um let's see what was the other one? Yep, that that fleeing into the mountains, that uh the wars, the army, it has nothing to do with today's time. It all was talking about um 70 AD. And I think is it was it one more Let's see. Let's see, but I still read Old Testament prophets as very relevant today. I see much of scripture is repetitive, but relevant in this time or era. Well, see, once you do that, the Bible sets the tone and it explains to you everything that happens. So, the Old Testament, the, the only way the Old Testament is relevant today is understanding how important the New Testament is. There's nothing that you can get out of the Old Testament except the things that deal with coming into the New Testament under Christ is going to be pretty much, and this is my opinion, beneficial to anybody because the Old Testament had different covenants. And the Most High only works with his children in covenants. So how can Noah's covenant or Abraham's covenant or Moses' covenant benefit people under the new covenant, under the covenant made with Christ's blood? We got to understand that the Bible teaches what it needs to teach to specific people at specific time. We're reading a history book. Um, and once you once you go, I mean, you go, you can go through it. Um, let's see here. Let's let's just go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's see what Isaiah says. Let's Isaiah starts off. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, king of Judah, what well, kings of Judah. So, Isaiah is concerning visions he saw during these days and it concerns Judah and Jerusalem. We're not in Jerusalem. We're in America. We don't know who Judah is. So that vision for Isaiah, when those people would have heard Isaiah in the Bible days, those people from Judah, they would have taken this personally because it was about them personally. Us in America, we can't take something written into Isaac, to, to Judah and Jerusalem and make it be about us. Well, there, there really is, um, you said history is very repetitive. The old was is a shadow of the New Testament. We are under grace, which means we fulfill the law, willing and not through command. But, see, I thank you. Uh, this, this is where um, pretty much... Uh, this is what like American theology comes in it, in my opinion, because history is repetitive because mankind usually does the same thing and not honoring the father. So the father don't let them progress. But there really is no shadow of the new and the new is the shadow of the old because only thing the new did was fulfill. If we're going to talk about Bible. The New Testament or the things that the disciples went through was fulfilling the Old Testament. And once those things were fulfilled, it was able to be moved away to go inside of the New Covenant. Because we today are only supposed to be concentrating on the New Covenant. Now, <clears throat> when Christ said he came in the volume of the book, you got to take it in context. What, what volume of the book was he talking about? Christ was pulling that from Psalms. Christ pulled, I come in the volume of the book from Psalms. So you have to read Psalms to understand what Christ is talking about. So if he pulled from Psalms and Psalms is talking about the volume of the book, what book is he talking about? The book of Psalms. There was no New Testament when Christ made this. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all that stuff was after Christ sp spoke that he came in the volume of the book. Christ pulled from Psalms. So we can't take things out of context in order to form a theology that's different from what the, what the disciples would have understood. So when he, if he pulled from a book, we got to stick it from that book. Just like when Revelation pulled from Isaiah, we got to go to Isaiah to understand what it's talking about. If Revelation pulled from Isaiah, we don't go to Genesis to find out what he's talking about. We got to stick in Isaiah. So when Christ said, I come in the volume of the book, he pulled that from Psalms. So you got to go to Psalms to understand what he's talking about. Him being, him, him being in Genesis has has, that, that point is void from what Christ said I come in the volume of the book because <clears throat> once again what book is he talking about he's talking about the book of Psalms he pulled that from the book of Psalms he didn't pull that from Torah that quote that he pulled he pulled from Psalms he didn't put it from Torah so we can't go to Torah to understand what he's talking about in Psalms unless Psalms take you to Torah you gotta you gotta it's you gotta do the 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 you gotta do the work you gotta follow the path you just can't jump around <clears throat> if 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 Paul pulls from um because he pulls a lot from Isaiah actually but if Paul pulls from Isaiah you don't go to Jeremiah to pull to understand what Paul is talking about you stick it in Isaiah Scripture says there are many books. What about the book of life, which is Christ? Well, the book of life actually was a book that they opened up during, I think it was the Feast of Tabernacles. I might be wrong. I think it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Or Anyway, it was one of those feasts. And uh, during that feast, they opened up the book, and the book was actually called the Book of Life. And they would open up the book, and I, they would write everybody, I believe, who attended the feast. So the Bible is actually speaking on real things. It's not speaking on um, 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 fantasy stuff. These are things that the Jews was actually doing back then. So the Jews actually literally had a book of life that they opened up for the Jerusalem, for the people who actually did the covenant. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't understand with that. One day there will be no book, no books, just our hearts and minds. I don't understand what that means because there's there's been literature throughout the whole entire thing and I don't think literature is going to stop it's not prophesied to stop the Bible is not talking about the the Bible isn't worried about books it's worried about spirituality it's worried about you getting to the Father and I believe you get to the Father through Christ see I think we it's too much Americanized stuff going on to want everything to be literature I mean literal you got to go through all of these idioms of Jerus of the Jews in order to understand what it's talking about. I mean, you, you got to do the you got to do the work, you got to do the studying because I can say anything right now, and then it's going to sound foreign to you. See, I, I I see I see you laughing and stuff already. It, it's foreign to you, even though I I'm, I'm knowing what I didn't see and what I didn't read already. So I mean, I study all day. Mariel, what's going on, man? You see me up late. Late. Yes, sir, indeed. But since we all, I want to I go through more of what this brother is bringing out. I read that in the beginning, the Most High created the heaven and the earth. You also know from Genesis chapter 1 that the Most High created this heaven and earth in seven days. We know that he rested on the seventh day. In this realm that we live in, there's such a thing as time. You look at the clock, time is constantly ticking. We are in the age of time. Yet, in the age of New Jerusalem and the age to come, we will not be confined by time. But it will be the realm. Now, I have to disagree again. 
<laughs> I have to disagree again because um, first of all, there is no age to come because the new age was an everlasting age. It has no end. And Daniel says the everlasting kingdom, an everlasting dominion. So uh, everlasting kingdom and everlasting dominion after this is my understanding. After the fourth beast, which I believe is the Roman Empire, uh, it will have no end. So we can't talk about a, 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 the new age or age to come because the age to come has has already came. <laughs> well, well, they sleep right now. Look, they they sleep right now. They sleep, so I had I had to get them while they were asleep. <laughs> you already know, my brother. I, I couldn't resist it. Well, my brother, they kept uh, hitting me up on Facebook, and since I was since I was uh, I was finna go to bed actually. You see where I got the time here? I was finna go to bed, and I was like, man, they keep sending me these videos. I'm gonna have to respond to one of them. They gonna think I'm out here tripping, so I'm responding to to, to this one. And the brother that was listening to the the one who wanted me to respond to it, he left actually. But I want to talk about this brother talking about uh, the age to come and we ain't in the age. Okay. First of all, the Masoretic text from the New King James Version, well, the King James Version Bible, they didn't get everything correct. So, I mean, all praise to the Most High for allowing more scholars to come in with less of an agenda to, to uh, actually. Um, uh, cipher some more of this text uh, and translate it. So now, I want everybody, this is my, once again, this is my discipleship study Bible, and I got a bunch of study Bibles, so I can show you the same thing in every one of them, but look what it says right here. Matthew 24, right? It says, the destruction of the temple foretold and the signs of the end of the age. So, that age that he was talking about, it was dealing with the destruction of the temple. That age deals with the destruction of the temple. So after the destruction of the temple, that old age passed away and the new everlasting age that has no end came about. So there is no new age or an age to come. We are in that age to come. So that's, that's easy to right now. Of eternity. That's another way you know that we are not in the kingdom of heaven right now. Because we still are limited to time. We still are limited to this confinement of being in the realm of hours, days, months, years. I don't and know what they have to do with anything. About this understanding as well. And he taught him about something called the eighth day of creation. Uh. Let's go to the book of Second Enoch, chapter 32 and 33. Uh, uh. Uh, he talking about the eighth day. Hold on here. Let me see what this brother finna bring out. He said second Enoch. Hold on, y'all. Let me be right back. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm gonna see if I can sneak my sister-in-law in the other room with all my books at. I'm gonna see if I can sneak in there and get my Enoch real fast. Let me. No, I ain't gonna do it. I ain't gonna do it. I ain't gonna do it. I ain't gonna, do it. I ain't gonna wake her or the baby up. I'm just gonna see what he gonna bring out. It's one. And let's read about this eighth day of creation right. or another way of saying the age that is to come where we will no longer be confined by time, but we will be in the realm of agelessness. All right. I think he said Enoch, right? So if he said Enoch, we got to understand that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. So Enoch wrote this thousands of years ago. If we're going to take that this is Enoch actually wrote this. Enoch actually wrote this thousands of years ago. So I want everybody to take that into consideration before we hear anything about this eighth day. Because the eighth day is actually prophesied. It's actually in the feast days. So this would be new for me knowing that this was in Enoch. So this is something new to me. And I'm actually excited about the eighth day because since all things are fulfilled, we are actually in the everlasting eighth day. We are in the eternal eighth day. So I would like to hear this. Okay, so now, 
Hold on, y'all. Before I go to this, let me uh, address this real fast. But scripture in New Testament states that if one blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness in this world or in the world to come. Well, that that way that that word sorry that word world there is supposed to be ages. In fact, let's see if I can find it real fast. <coughs> Anybody got the verse so I can look it up? Anybody got the verse? Anybody got that verse? Hear me out, y'all. Because I'm pretty sure that that word, world, there's supposed to be ages. Not world, but ages. So, let, let, uh, anybody got that verse real fast? And I hate to get off of here just to look it up. But if ain't nobody going to drop the verse, I'll just get it off real fast and come right back. All right, let's see, Mark 3, 28 through 30. Let me see if this is it. Mark 3, 28 through 30. No, that ain't it. Uh, let's see if we can give me a parallel. Uh, Mark 3, 28. Nah, somebody give me that scripture. Hello. All right, Matthew twelve thirty two. Matthew twelve thirty two. All right, let's see. Matthew twelve thirty two. Let's see what's the rendering of that. <clears throat> Matthew twelve. All right. This is once again. This is from my discipleship study Bible says, uh, whosoever speaks a, a word against the Son of Man will be, f sorry, therefore I tell you people will be forgiven for every sin and blasphemy, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Who, whoever speaks a word of, against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but who, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or the age to come. Okay, so now, when Christ said this, right? Christ was living in what age? This is the age before the new covenant. So all of the covenants, all the way up to the new covenant, Christ was living in that age, or what we like to coin the age of Moses. So Christ was living in that age, right? Matthew 24 said, the new age, the signs of the end of the age, right, was going to happen during the destruction of the temple. So, Christ made a statement saying that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age, which will be the age of Moses, or the age to come, which would happen after the destruction of the temple. So, Christ, that's why the scripture says Christ was born at the fullness of time. Once again, Christ was born at the fullness of time. Where else? See, I like doing this. I can do this all day. This, this is, this is. I Man, I like doing this. Once you go to Daniel chapter two, Christ was born during. Let's see here. King of Kings. Christ was born doing the iron and clay. Once you go to Daniel 7, Christ was born during the, let's see here, uh, Daniel 7 and 7. After this, I saw in the night vision a fourth beast. So then after the fourth beast, we have the judgment. See? It says it right there. Judgment before the ancient one happens during the fourth beast, actually. So, Christ was born during the fourth beast. Christ was born at the fullness of time. Christ was born and during, during Christ's um, generation. He said, this generation will not pass till all things are fulfilled. He kept saying, uh, some of y'all standing here will be alive when uh, I return in my kingdom. So Christ came at the fullness of the age. And he also, let me see here, if I can find it in Hebrew. 
Let me, let me get it here. Let's find it in Hebrew real fast, and I'm, I'm gonna go straight back to the what you call it. Well, let's see. Um, Hebrews one and four, ain't it? No. Oh, right here, Hebrews one and two. Look, hath uh, God who is a hundred times and in a diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his son so we have it in Hebrews 2 that once again Christ came during the last days according to the Bible so the last days according to the Bible occurred during the Roman Empire the revelation is about 70 AD which occurred during the Roman Empire Christ was born during the fullness of time, which was during the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire. The um, two-thirds, one-thirds being cut off occurred during the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire. Everything, the end times, the time of the end, the end of the age, all of that occurred during the Roman Empire. So the Bible only gets us to the Roman Empire because after that timeline, we're in the everlasting kingdom. We don't need no more prophets. We don't need no more Bible. We don't need any more things. We only need to know how to get inside of covenant with Christ. That's it. Now, the world is not always ages. It's how they uh, translate it. The word aeon is ages. The word cosmos is world. So sometimes when they saw the word cosmos in Hebrew or Greek, they translated it world. Sometimes when they saw the word aeon, they translated it as world. And there's two more different words that they use also that they translated as world. So it depends on which original word you're talking about. The words aeon means ages. So in that time, it's talking about ages. But Christ came at the during the last days. The last days was during the Roman Empire. Nothing can go past the Roman Empire and the Bible. So, back to what we were saying. Of no time. Listen to this. The Most High is talking to Enoch, and he's revisiting how he created this heaven and earth in seven days, and he's given Enoch the metaphor that the eighth day of creation is the time of eternity. For we also know in scripture that to the most high a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So the thousand year reign of Christ, for those of you who wonder why he will reign a thousand years and not two thousand or why not five hundred years. The Messiah will reign on this earth a thousand years because it will bring to completion the age of this. Totally incorrect. Okay, totally incorrect. First of all, a thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years. It's what we call an idiom. You know, here in America, we can say it's raining cats and dogs. So if somebody um, pick up this for, uh, let's say somebody from Asia, find that 4,000 years from now, the same saying it's raining cats and dogs, should they go around teaching people that it was really raining cats and dogs? Or... Should they say, well, there's an idiom that they use in America. So once again, this that's just a Hebrew idiom. A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. He never said, take this, put it concrete, stamp it. Because if that's the case, when he was giving Jeremiah the prophecy about the 70 years, and one day with the Lord is a thousand years, combine that with the 70 years, man, you're talking about like what, 7 million, 7 billion years? Mm -mm. When he gave uh, Daniel the prophecy about 70 weeks, if one day with the Lord is, 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 is a thousand years and a thousand years one day, then those 70 weeks, that's a long time, y'all. So, that, it, it just doesn't fit, y'all. It just doesn't fit. Th these are idioms, and we can't make idioms be uh, uh, doctrine. We can't just make it be groundbreaking doctrine. So that's one thing. Uh, but I'm, 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 I want to hear what he says. What, what he got to say about this? He will reign a thousand years, for that will complete the seventh day or the seven thousand epoch or era of this creation, and then comes quote unquote the eighth day or the age of eternity it's a reason why people in the eastern world is not teaching this 
I just want to say that. It's a reason why you can go in the Eastern world where they actually are more keen to the uh, Hebrew mindset. It's a reason why they're not teaching this. It's a reason why only uh, the Christians after uh, centuries after Christ start teaching this was literal and these was Hellenistic people who didn't understand as you can tell didn't understand the, uh, the Israelite culture or idioms and uh, I mean it's, it's, it's a reason why we hear this only around America it's, it's a reason it's a reason time will be no more oh yeah and Christ ain't coming back on uh, uh, to, to, on earth for a thousand years I don't know what that's earth we live in now here's what it says here's what the most high told Enoch and I bless hello and I hate keep keep stopping it, but let, let's make another point. With Christ in this thousand year reign, first of all, it's not even a little over a thousand years. It just means complete. A thousand in the scriptures pretty much means completion. But let's just say by hook or by crook. Let's just say that it's literal, it's a literal thousand years, okay? Let's just throw it out there. If it's a literal thousand years, can we just read exactly what it says? Revelation 20 uh, and 2 and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years so this thousand years that Satan is bound is the thousand year millennium right uh, verse 4 I saw thrones and them that sat upon the and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls souls of them that were beheaded beheaded for witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, so these people living and reigning with Christ a thousand years, right? Verse 5, but the rest of the dead, look what it says, the rest of the dead. So these people that was living and reigning with Christ were dead people. Okay, y'all? These were dead people. And I still want to see where it says that this happened on earth. Yeah, I don't see where the rain happened on earth. I guess they said when the when the uh when the um, when they compassed the camp of the saints since that was on earth Christ reigning had to be on earth so I guess we, I can see where they drew that from I can see where they drew that from then but once again these people are dead so all the people that ruled and reigned with Christ were the people that was martyred right these were martyred people once again uh Judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not, see, they was martyred for Jesus and God, and they had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, nor received his mark upon their foreheads. So these are martyrs. So these people, I mean, if you weren't martyred for Christ, and if you weren't already dead, you weren't going to be part of this thousand year reign anyway. So, that's just a little side note about the thousand year reign that if people want to take it literal, it still happens in a realm that you can't see. It's a spiritual realm. The seventh day, which is the Sabbath, on which he rested from all his works. For those of you who wonder why we keep the Shabbat, that's why. We keep the Sabbath not trying to be religious Pharisees, but because the Most High, whenever he created this heaven and earth, he rested on the seventh day. And that day was not Sunday, for Sunday is the first day of the week, not the seventh. The Most High created the heavens and the earth rested on the seventh day. Please share this particular discussion with those of your family who are still trapped in the lie of Christianity. Share this with them so they also can get a true and correct understanding of the kingdom, the millennial reign of the Messiah, such and so forth. So the Most High was reminded Enoch, he created the heavens and the earth in seven days and rested on the seventh day, which is why we keep the Sabbath. And listen to what he says here next in 2 Enoch chapter 33, starting at verse 1. It says, And I appointed the eighth day also, that the eighth day should be the first created after my work, 
and that the first seven revolve in the form of the seventh thousand, and that at the beginning of the eighth thousand, there should be a time of not counting, endless with neither years, nor months, nor weeks, nor days, nor hours. What the Father here is saying is that in the new heaven and the new earth, since there will be no sun, since there will be no moon, since there will be no nighttime, since there will be no temple, there will be no measuring of time. It will be endless, infinity, eternity. The era of the new Jerusalem and the kingdom of heaven, which comes after the thousand year reign of the Messiah, is an era of timelessness where there will be no time. Well, that's all. Uh, 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 that's all ridiculous. But <laughs> uh, let's see here. The eight thousand, all right. The seven thousand. I can sort of see where you get that from, but then it, it, it'll go against the, uh, the Book of Jubilees and all that stuff too. So it'll be mm, too conflicting. And, and I don't even think there's a second Enoch. That sounds like to me there's some um, hyper-Christianity stuff. But uh, I'm not going to judge it. So I'm going to leave it here. But I'm going to show you where the, where's the eighth day at in scriptures. Um, I thought it was Leviticus 23. It might be 22. Hold on. I was 23. Let me see if I can find it real fast. The feast and seven days. I thought, I thought it was in um, Leviticus 23. The atonement whatsoever should be... Uh, if we use a holy and the Sabbath, a lot of free will offering the 15th day. Yeah, I think it's right there. Um, Leviticus 23 and 19. Also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Yep, I think it's that right there. That's that eighth day Sabbath right there. That was symbolic for the uh, eighth day rest of creation, which we call a but da 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 Sunday. It would be called the first day, or what we call Sunday. So the eighth day of creation would actually be a Sunday, not a Shabbat or Sab. I mean, it'll be a Shabbat, but it won't be on this what we call Saturday. It will be on what we call here in America Sunday. So I don't know if you're saying that that uh, that Sunday worship should go because we have the everlasting day occurring on a Sunday. So I mean, this thing to take in consideration. What up? What up, fam? What up, Keith? Man, I'm up late. I'm gonna get ready to go to bed, but I got a few more things to touch on this this Bible stuff. We are not in that age yet. That age is the age that is to come. We are not even in the days of the three and a half years of tribulation yet. I'm going to get into that as well. That <laughs> so now we're not in the tribulation. And I agree with him. We're not in the days of the tribulation, the three and a half years of tribulation. Because it already happened. So no, we're not in the days of that tribulation. Uh, I agree with that. And once you go to Matthew 24, it says, uh, Matthew 24 and 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall there ever will be. When shall be great tribulations? When you see the abomination of desolation, then let Judea flee into the mountains. <clears throat> when would you see the abomination of desolation? During the dun, 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 verse 2, the stones not being left one upon another. So, you will see the abomination of desolation during the destruction of the temple. And during the destruction of the temple is the Great Tribulation period. When did this happen? 70 AD. This is a 70 AD prophecy. Not an American 2019 prophecy. 
So yeah, we're not in the tribulation period because it happened almost 2,000 years ago. But this is what happened when Americans get Americans get the Bible, and I'm an American, so I can say that. This is what happened when Americans get the Bible and take the Bible out of its context and context and try to make the Bible say whatever we want it to say. Once you read it in this historical context, you can see that it's talking about the destruction of the temple. But once you don't like that and you want it to be more about us, you say, yeah, this actually means us. Even though the Jews actually were destroyed, even though over a million Jews were killed during 70 AD, over 97,000 was taken captive. Even though that occurred, the temple was destroyed. Even though that occurred in 70 AD to the Israelites in Jerusalem, this actually means about us in America. Man, get out of here with that. Before the thousand year reign of the Messiah. After I get done, you're going to understand all this fully. Hallelujah. What we need to get is that we currently are living in the heaven and earth that the Most High created in Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to give it five more minutes. The heaven and earth that the Messiah talked about. Listen to what he says here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. Because remember, the world and the earth was created through the Messiah. All right, let's so go. It's better to go to, to understand the earth and the heavens than the one who created them. All right, let's go. All things were created through the Messiah. The word became flesh, John chapter 1. Listen to what that same word who became flesh, that same light, that was in the beginning when the Most High said, let there be light. Let's see what the way, the truth, and the life had to say about this heaven and earth. The Messiah says in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The Messiah here is... Okay, so now, what did we just miss out in that? We missed the last part of 18. Till all be fulfilled. So it didn't say it was going to never pass. See, this is the old Mosaic Covenant. It didn't say the old Mosaic Covenant wasn't going to never pass. It said it wasn't going to be passed until all was fulfilled. So, what was all fulfilled at? In that in that passage, go to Luke 24, 44 through 46. Luke 24, 44 through 46. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. Uh-oh, he's telling what had to be fulfilled. And in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. You remember, I come in the volume of the book. He got that from Psalms. So, uh, concerning me. Then he opened up their understanding that they might understand scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem so Christ was saying the things specifically he had to fulfill look verse 28 and ye are witnesses of these things so guess what all those things were fulfilled so every um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for I don't want to say regular. All of the all of the things that what's the word I'm looking for? Statuses, judgment. I don't know. Oh, it's late. I can't think right now. But everything that that needed to be fulfilled or needed to happen in order for the law to pass away occurred. All obligations was met for the passing away of the law. He said until all be fulfilled. And guess what? All things about him were fulfilled, and the disciples were witnesses to all of that. Oh, yeah, that heaven and earth right there, it means the temple. It doesn't mean literal heaven and earth. But let's keep going. That as long as this present heaven and earth exists, this heaven and earth that was created in Genesis chapter 1, as long as this current heaven and earth exists, 
the law is not done away with. The only way that the Torah and laws of the Torah will be done is when this heaven and earth is destroyed. And we know... No, let's see. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what it says at all. It didn't say until heaven and earth was destroyed. Let's read it again. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Not till the heaven and earth pass. It says till all be fulfilled. So once again, let me read it. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So once, so in other words, he's saying, until the temple pass away and destroyed, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till everything written about me is fulfilled. That's what it's actually saying. But even if you take it to say that, for all things to be fulfilled, when all things are fulfilled, then that jot and tittle could pass away. That this heaven and earth is not destroyed until after the thousand year reign of the Messiah. Whenever the Messiah reigns for a thousand years, it will be on this earth. This earth we live on right now. The Messiah will... And remember... And in Luke 24, he said, this is the things that I talked to you that had to be fulfilled. And notice he never said anything about the heaven and earth passing away. Rain on this earth, not some mystical uh, cloudy sky realm. No, this earth, this earth with the trees, with the sun, with the moon, with the birds, with the dogs, with the cats. All that encompasses this earth, this universe, the Messiah will reign and touch down with his ten toes and his feet on this earth and reign. Hallelujah. And the law of Torah will not be done away with until after the thousand year reign of the Messiah when this heaven and earth is destroyed. That's why when I read to you earlier that in New Jerusalem... But once again... Once again, the Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> I mean, he can say it, and if that's what he want to push, that's fantastic. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the things were passed from the law when all was fulfilled. So all was fulfilled, allowing the things to pass from the law. It never said anything about the heaven and earth are destroying a Christ thousand year millennium reign he just created all that he, he made all that up I'm sorry it's all made up that's not what the Bible says Jerusalem, there will be no temple there's not going to be no temple in New Jerusalem for the temple laws of Torah will not even need to be done because those laws will be done away when this heaven and earth is destroyed that right there refutes the doctrine of many who say the laws and commands are done away because the laws and commands cannot be done away until this heaven and earth that we live on right now is destroyed. That has not happened. Once again, that's not what the Bible says. So uh, he, he just made it up. And I just showed y'all through the Bible as well as through Josephus that the heaven and earth was actually the temple. I used the Bible and Josephus to show you that the heaven and earth passing away was the temple it was not the literal heaven and earth and yet so Torah still stands hallelujah the Sabbath still stands I guess and all those <laughs> things that are spoken of in the law still stand because this heaven and earth it he said all things spoken of in the law still stands uh, I don't even want to touch that. <laughs> okay. Not destroyed. Some may ask, why does this heaven and earth need to be destroyed? Why not just, if the Most High is truly the Most High, why doesn't he just fix up this heaven and this earth and not destroy it? Well, I'll give you the answer to that. Job chapter 9 verse 24. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. This earth has been overtaken. Okay. 
And then we go to Job, right? And we take Job out of context. The, the, the earth is given to the hand of the wicked. Once, look up the history of Job. Job was written between uh, the time of Abraham and Moses. Job was actually thought to be written before there was a Mosaic covenant. Before there were the laws of Moses. Which means Job was perfect, not based off of the laws of Moses, but based off of the righteousness, which was dealing with the covenant of Abraham. But anyway, besides that, Job was saying the world was given over into the hand of the wicked outside of the Mosaic covenant. Right? So the things that Job was talking about is before the Mosaic covenant. So this is before the scattering of Israel. This is before the curses. This is before there was a Jacob. This is before, well, not before there was a Jacob, because Jacob and Esau was around. But this is before <clears throat> there was um, pretty much any of the things that we see now. This is before all of that. So, for it to, let's leave it in context. The hand, the world was given into the hand of the wicked. And those wicked people were not in the Mosaic Covenant or after the Mosaic Covenant. Those wicked people were before the Mosaic Covenant. So we just can't just throw scriptures out and try to make them go with our point. By wicked and sinister forces. This earth has been overtaken by those who are defiled and unclean. And they've also defiled the earth and made the earth unclean. And before we stop there, you also need to know that the heavens and the universe are defiled and unclean as well. For it says in Job chapter 15, verse 15, Behold, the Most High put of no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Even the universe is defiled in the eyes of the Most High. Even the universe... Alright, so I gotta go to bed now, but hopefully uh, we all grasp what I was bringing out and what the brother was bringing out and uh, hopefully there was some edify going on but I mean my, my, my stand still stands the whole bible has been fulfilled already uh, proving it several times on top of times every debate I prove it I mean every time we talk about bible I prove it uh, and we're in the kingdom and what we need to be doing inside of this kingdom I've improved it several times. What more can I do? But I mean, if y'all keep sending me the videos, I go through them, and, and and as long as the Lord allowed me, and I try to give my uh, commentary on them with scripture. But until then, love you all. I like to say shalom. Everything has been fulfilled. Welcome to the new heavens and the new earth. Welcome to the kingdom, and try to enjoy. Alright, subscribe to my channel, A -O -A -O -S -D Chandler, Assembly of Sound Doctrine Chandler, or you can look up the Preterist Trucker. Alright.